Okay. Cool. All right. <clears throat> I don't know how well this is going to work. I have barely any 4G over here, but it looks like it's, it's working. Hey guys, welcome. Today, my first live YouTube, very excited. Um, we're gonna be building a compost pile. So I just wanted to take you guys through that whole process and show you guys how it's done. And uh, I actually have two new YouTube videos coming out in the next uh, week. I just need to edit, finish editing them. And uh, those are gonna be like a complete walkthrough of how to build and turn a compost pile, measure it, um, how to ensure it's safe and fully composted, all that. Hey, what's up guys? And um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. You know, if you, don't, if you can't sit through the whole live video, I'm gonna be showing you guys exactly how to make really good compost in the next couple days. So the first thing that I've done here <clears throat> is I've uh, just put down a bedding of carbon material. And when you're building a compost pile, um, the formula that, um, that I go by and is I think kind of sort of the best formula is to have 60% carbon or brown. So carbon material is stuff like straw, leaves, wood chips, um, anything dead or that's you know lost all of its green color. And then so 60% browns and then you mix that with 40% high nitrogen or greens. So that's examples of that would be uh, grass clippings um, from the farm, you know, plants that you've pulled out, old old uh, lettuce beds, stuff like that. And most importantly, animal manure. And animal manure is considered a high nitrogen. What's up everybody? If you guys ask questions, um, as I go through this process of making the pile, there's gonna be periods where I'm just watering the pile or just raking. And at those periods, that's when I'm gonna check the questions and answer them for you guys. So uh, getting back to the formula, um, it's 60% browns, 40% nitrogen. Of that 40% nitrogen, if you can have 10% of those nitrogen be either animal manure, a vegetable that's high in nitrogen, such as a legume, so that legumes are peas, beans, things like that, they will really help to heat up that compost. For browns, shredded paper, yeah, I, I use, um, uh, untreated, completely, you know, glueless, um, tapeless, there's no writing, there's no gloss, um, cardboard, uh, shredded paper, you know, like sometimes from Amazon, you know, there'll be like, like that shredded cardboard stuff or that, um, that really thin, almost like butcher-like paper. That stuff's really great for uh, compost or for your worms. So we've got my first layer of browns going here. So how I like to think about this formula that I've been talking about, the 60% brown, 40% green, is I just think about it in chunk layers in the pile. So we're gonna be making layers of brown, green, brown, green, all the way up. And <clears throat> just for a rough idea, you can kind of do something like this, like about eight inches of browns, then put about six inches of greens on top of that. That's like a really rough estimate way to do it. If you've had problems in the past not getting your compost piles to heat up enough, um, what I've found is usually I haven't added, added enough greens. So I'm gonna be showing you guys how much I put in. So I knew I wanted to make this video. So I've been saving up a bunch of, ugh, it's really heavy, a bunch of greens material from my garden beds and stuff. So this is like leftover basil and uh, lettuce and all those sort of things. Oh, SDSU, baby, that's where I went to school too. What's up? Um, and uh, so basically this is my high nitrogen material. So I'm gonna put that on next. So as you can see, I've been soaking this carbon material. Now my carbon material is mixed in with chicken manure. Because if you guys have seen any of my videos, um, you've seen that I have about 20 chickens and um, this is all the bedding. So I've raked that out. So it's chicken manure mixed in with all the browns and that's really, really helpful for getting things to heat up really nicely. Chicken manure is one of the best animal manures to use. So I've just been getting it wet 
because it's really important to get the, the pile thoroughly uh, soaked and these browns soak up a lot of water. All right, so sprinkler's done. And let me just put on some gloves so if I touch the camera later, I'm not getting junk all over it. I don't know. This is my first time doing a live video, guys, on YouTube, so forgive me. Okay, so here we go, guys. So now we're going to spread out the greens. This thing's really heavy. And these greens, honestly, like, I let them rot a little too long because I was waiting to do this video. I would have liked to use these earlier. a pretty good layer so it's pretty thick and it's already started to decompose a lot so I'm just trying to get it over the top of my browns and there we go that's my first greens layer and a lot of those plants are from basil actually so basil's not the best plant to compost because its stems are kind of woody after the first week and it heats up, I may even pull those stems out of there. Okay, so now the next step is just to add the next layer onto it. So we're gonna add on some more chicken bedding that I've already pre-collected. Okay, <clears throat> the next step is just to soak this in. And I'm gonna add one more really special ingredient and that's inoculant. So inside of this pile, what we're trying to achieve is a massive growth expansion of the microbes that are in living in the manure, living on these plants, living in the soil and explode their population so that this pile raises in heat between 130 and 160 degrees in temperature. And the reason we wanna reach those temperatures is because we're trying to kill off any pathogens, maybe from the manure, maybe from any possible situation. We're trying to kill off weed seeds and pathogens. And then as you're raising the pile's temperature from you know, air temperature all the way up to 160, these different microbes need these different temperature ranges to be born and live. What's up, Kevin? Epic garden in the bin. So um, basically what we need to have happen is have this right ratio of carbon and nitrogen because those are the foods that these microbes are gonna live on. And then coupled with that is the moisture and we need to have the right amount of moisture. If we put too much moisture, it'll actually suffocate the pile not allowing oxygen to flow in. And what that will cause is an anaerobic environment in the compost pile. And anaerobic just means a low oxygen environment. Aerobic is what we're trying to achieve. And an aerobic environment is one that is um, oxygen rich. So the key is to always keep this thing um, aerobic and keep it, keep the healthy bacteria active anaerobic bacteria cause diseases. Grew up in Lemon Grove, awesome. I love living here. Um, so, oh, let's get the water going. And the inoculant. Okay, so to make more of these microbes, we're gonna add an inoculant, like I said. And I actually make the inoculant. It's the same exact thing just about 
uh, eight weeks later. So this is some finished compost here. And I'm sorry it's kind of dark, guys, but if I have my phone in the sun, it's going to overheat and turn off. Um, so inside of this compost is, a, you know, billions of microbes. And by sprinkling this over the top and soaking it in with water, it's going to spread them throughout the pile. And they're just going to be like kids in a candy store once I get this pile built. And they're just going to go to work uh, eating and expanding their population. So it's kind of hard to water this pile with the sprinkler right now. Okay, now that I've got the inoculants on there, I just put like one shovel for full, just a small amount because um, most of the greens that I'm using in my piles are all from my garden beds. So, you know, when I pull them out, there's dirt on that stuff anyways. So. I like to think that my greens are already inoculated with a bunch of soil anyways. Um, but at each layer, I'd like a shovel full or two to just ensure that there's going to be enough populations to, to really be in there to just be spread throughout the pile. Okay, so let me tell you guys about another green that we're going to be adding here in a little bit. Um, you know, this pile, about every layer you want to moisten for probably 15 minutes honestly it really takes a long time especially if you're using straw straw is not my favorite material but it's the cheapest and, and works really well for the chickens so that's that's why i use it so my next big green and this is my big secret to getting a backyard compost pile super hot it's actually the only way i've ever gotten a backyard pile to get uh, above 140 degrees and that's Bokashi. So Bokashi, I don't have the bag with me, but it just, it just looks like, uh, you know, it's a bag of oatmeal, it's a bag of dried out grains. And these grains have been inoculated with lactobacillus. And lacto is a very common uh, fungi that it's actually in the air all the time. And um, it, uh, what's it in? I don't know, I think they, they used to use it for making food or sourdough starter, something like that. Anyways, I could be wrong. They use different bacteria for different purposes. But for this, we use lactobacillus. And basically what it is, we're pre-digesting our waste, our food waste, with these anaerobic bacteria. Lactobacillus is an anaerobic one. And not all the anaerobic bacteria are bad and, and cause humans disease, actually. So. If you have ever made beer or alcohol, then you know you've used yeast and you, the process of making alcohol is an anaerobic process. And actually, that's something that Dr. Elaine Ingham always talks about is that if your soil goes anaerobic, uh, oh man, this smells like crap. <laughs> um, if your soil goes anaerobic, uh, what happens is they create alcohols. The, the, the soil microbes themselves create alcohols and then that burns the roots and uh, kills them. And uh, I just remember that from uh, an Elaine Ingham talk, just throwing that out there. Elaine Ingham is a soil uh, scientist and biologist, highly recommend checking out any of her lectures. Okay, back to the Bokashi. My buddy Ronnie Campell of um, Food to Soil out in North County, San Diego is where I get my Bokashi grain. And so I'll try to show you guys. So inside of this, you see I've got, you know, tea bags from when I made kombucha, coffee, eggshell. Um, there's citrus in here. And what's special about Bokashi is that you're actually able to, to uh, decompose and compost everything that is difficult to do in a standard aerobic compost pile. So in this, I can put citrus, meat, eggs, or yeah, you know, eggs, dairy, anything. It pre-digests in here, then goes into the compost piles of green, and it's pre-digested. So these nutrients are just ready to break down and be incorporated into the pile. 
And basically what I've found is like the Bokashi just uh, liquefy, like it turns everything into liquid in there. Like it just, um, it melts everything, I guess. I don't know. But um, that's how I've been able to get temperatures of like 158 or 158 or 159 was my record so far in this backyard. In a backyard compost pile that's only, you know, four foot by four foot by four foot high. And um, so that's one thing I didn't mention is the size of this pile. What's up? And um, so the size of the pile at a bare, bare minimum, you want to have a three foot by three foot by three foot high compost pile. So like a three foot cube. Um, but honestly, four foot is the absolute best. And the reason that you, you're treating like an actual cubic structure is because you're tr the core of that pile is what's going to heat up the most. So when you build a pile that is like a sphere, or not a sphere, a circle, and you're creating the most sur surface area inside of the pile. So that's why we're doing it like that. So I'm attempting to build like a four foot by four foot or, you know, maybe five foot pile here. Okay, so we got to let this water more. So if you guys have any questions, I'm going to go through the, the questions in the chat and then we'll keep going. Sometimes I'll just take the hose and manually spray the pile. That's like, it takes longer, but that's like the best way. Okay, I'll try to do this here. Let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. What's up, Max? So glad uh, my videos have been able to help you. Thank you very much, Silver Topaz. Hey, Mom. <laughs> I can't get drip tape in Australia. Wow. I wonder what you guys use as an alternative. Um, I know there's an Israeli made uh, drip. It's not called drip tape. It's called Netafilm. That stuff is like crazy high quality. It's, it's the best quality drip in the world, basically. Uh, maybe check that out, man. Um, other than that, I mean... If all you guys have is half inch poly, that would kind of surprise me. Um, but maybe you could make your own. Okay. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, Bo. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Green at Gardening. Mm -hmm -hmm. Browns answered that. Any questions, guys, about the compost pile? Or if you guys have other questions, I'll answer those too. It's gonna take a while to get some more water in this. Hey, Bet Bet. Got my local neighbors here. We got everybody. Love it. Where's everybody calling in from? Mostly, I think, the United States. I saw one Australia. Um, for my compost, it's typically taking about eight weeks. And that's really only because the material that I use, the carbon material, because I'm starting out with like. When you start out with straw that's not really that's really long and not broken down, it um, it takes a lot longer. There's this one method called the Berkeley composting method, and that is one of the fastest ways. It's a very precise way to do it. So they shred everything. They shred all the browns and all the greens, and that just creates a lot more surface area, a lot more air inside the pile, which causes it to reach like really high temperatures really quickly for long periods of time. Um, they can do it, they say they can do it in like 30 days, 20 to 30 days or something. I've never done that, but um, I'd love to experiment with that to see how quick I can get it to go. Sorry, that sprinkler's had its day. Um, let me see here. Who, what? What size emitter spacing for drip tape? If you're doing intensive vegetable growing, then the spacing should be every six inches. Um, size and the emitter spacing. What size? Uh, it's just standard drip tape. The um, It's 15 mils, the thickness. 
I use a compost thermometer to check the temperature. Compost doesn't get hot enough. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. If, if your compost doesn't get hot enough to reach 130 is what you should be shooting for. If you guys can get to 130 and hold it there for three days, then, you know, arguably you've killed all the, the dangerous pathogens. Um, if you're not selling food or selling soil, then that's safe enough for you guys. Um, and, you know, it's always safer to let a pile just like go cold and sit cold for a month. That's another way to ensure safety. But honestly, you know, outbreaks of disease and things like that are crazy rare. Um, so, but if it is going to go cold and you just, you're only able to get it to like 100 degrees, it'll just take longer. And, you know, turning it more often will help it break down. Keeping it um, at the right moisture level. The, moisture le the right moisture level is like a sponge, like a, like a wrung out sponge. So if you were to wring out a sponge and you sque squeeze it really hard, like a couple drops would come out, but that's it. Because like I said, over wet will cause an anaerobic situation. But yeah, the higher temperatures for the longer amount of time, that's the quicker those piles are going to break down. Can I use moldy vegetables? Yes, I just did. A bunch of that stuff I just put in was moldy and gross. I would put a caveat on that. If you're going to be using, you know, starting to break down stuff and you just want to make, if it's already starting to liquefy and get like that, um, you just want to make sure that you don't add too much moisture and cause the pile to go anaerobic because that moldy, um, soggy mess like that I'm using in here is basically anaerobic. So we want to flip that and, and make it go aerobic in that pile, just like the Bokashi is going to do. So just be careful. Don't, don't put the sprinkler on a dig hole in the top and let them fill with water. Yeah, that would be good. Um, that thing is like so broken. I just kind of, I need to get a new one. <laughs> yes, I have done aquaponics. Um, when I was starting out uh, in farming and gardening and stuff, that really appealed to me. And I actually built a three tote system. Um, the Murray Hallam three tote system that I'm sure a lot of people are, the IBC tote system. Um, and I used tilapia and I built it like shortly before I went to Korea and I lived in Korea and taught English there for a couple years. So my parents ran, ran that aquaponic system um, for like a year after I built it and it worked pretty well, but I, I didn't build like a swirl filter for it. I, I, you know, there's a few things I could have built better on it and it kind of eventually failed because my parents didn't know what to do. And, um, but I really like aquaponics. It's very interesting. I like the idea of trying to do some sort of aquaponic system actually in nature where you create a pond and have like a living ecosystem and you're pumping that water through like a, D, uh, a DWC system or, 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 you know, some other system. But yeah, you know, in the future, once I've got land and some more money, I, bl I plan on doing all sorts of crazy experiments. Yeah, I get a ton of grubs in my compost, especially right now, this time of year, at least in Southern California, we get this green beetle called the fig eater beetle. And those guys lay, I don't know, I could probably find an example, but yeah, they're just like constantly in my compost. And now I've got skunks and possums coming in my yard to come get the grubs. So it's been kind of annoying, but it's part of the deal. Best for nitrogen. Mm, well, as far as like what's highest in nitrogen, chicken is highest, I believe. Uh, rabbit manure is great. Um, they each have their own attributes. They each have their own um, makeup right and their own microbiome and that whole thing because all the digestive systems in the different animals have a different mix. Um, the more types of manure, the better, honestly. If you, if you, could, if you had a blend, that would be wonderful. Some of the best compost I've ever got was a blend of like cow, horse, and rabbit. I've never made black garlic, but I wonder if you've seen the uh, the Vermont compost video. I forgot the farmer's name, but he makes it in his compost. That's the guy who has a free chicken system. That's a really cool video. Jeff Lawton and Diego Footer have been there. So if you search that and Vermont compost, you can see how he's raising like three or 400 chickens just off of uh, composted waste. All right, let me check this pile real quick, guys. Yeah, it's
it's getting there. Maybe another like five minutes. And then um, I'll do the next layer of greens. So, what do we got here? Something to keep adding. Uh -huh. I don't know what you're saying. Um, grubs in the compost. It's okay. Those guys are um, they're living off the organic matter in there, getting bigger, and then they're going to pupate and turn into whatever beetle they are. Uh, to me, grubs are not a big problem. Um, if you have like a raised bed, I have seen infestations where there's like hundreds, and maybe you can make an argument where that's going to cause damage to your plants. Um, but other than that, it's not that, it doesn't bother me. I just feed them to my chickens when I see them. Bokashi is a, Bokashi is a process of using an anaerobic bacteria called lactobacillus to basically ferment your food scraps. You can do meat, uh, any, anything, anything. Meat, eggs, citrus, onions, doesn't matter. I am not Korean, <laughs> but I lived in Korea. Uh, my wife is Korean, actually. Um, that's right. Those grubs can kind of help you break it down. Um, I haven't read this, but I'm, I guarantee you those grubs, you know, they're eating, so they're obviously pooping. So that means they're adding some sort of castings and beneficial nutrients and bacteria. So I don't see them as a negative. In Scottsdale with 40 square feet. Um, I'd probably do greens and herbs because those are things that you'd probably use a lot. It'd be hard to do fruiting stuff like tomatoes and peppers and all that. So I'd probably stick to herbs, edible flowers, and greens, lettuce. Microgreens are excellent as well for a small space. I Oh, the Bokashi? I'm going to make a video about that eventually, guys. But um, I'll show you. Oh, you know what? We got to pause here. So the water's done. Um, I'll explain the Bokashi in a second. Let me uh, do the next layer here. So the next layer, we're going to do more greens. Okay, so we're doing 40% um, greens, right? That's the formula. So, let me get the gloves on again. And we'll mix this up. My next bucket of greens is more like cut salad greens and like my leftover beds that I, my kale mix and my lettuce mix that I tore out earlier this week. Okay, so let's get some more. Crazy heavy. Oh, this is gross. So here it is. That's what I'm putting in there now. This is a leftover lettuce mix, and the person who talked about it being moldy, there's some mold right there for you. It's all good. Gnarly. You guys need smell a vision. Okay. So this smells anaerobic. And anaerobic smells like death, basically, like a dead rat, or it smells like like really gross sh shit, basically. So now we're kind of at a point where I have to go collect more browns. Actually, you know, I'm going to bring you guys in there. So I'll bring you guys into the coop 
and I'll show you how I clean out my chicken coop and um, I'll show you where you can get the best if you have chickens you probably not probably you already know where the best place to get manure is and that's inside of the coop where they sleep so let me Ooh, I have to be careful because those chickens can escape on me so let's um Okay, one step at a time here. So let me move you guys first and then... Alright, it's not gonna work. Okay, so let me unplug this. Sorry guys, this is going to be the one little pause in this video here. If you guys have any questions, if you post them, I'm going to answer them again in like 10 minutes once I get the next part of the pile going and watered. Because once I water again, we're going to have to wait for another 10 minutes. So here's the coop. And then, oh, I got to get the wheel, oh god. <laughs> so I'll let you guys just watch the chickens here. Maybe. Maybe they'll put on a show or something for you guys. We got chickens trying to escape right now. It's getting crazy. Okay, almost there. set up so I'm a big fan of uh, building little coops for many reasons and this is one of my favorite reasons it makes cleaning out the coop crazy easy so I just set my wheelbarrow under there and then drag it out I also like raised coops because you can like put their feet, their food under them. It protects them from the rain. It protects them from the sun. And then they get more square footage of a chicken run because they can go underneath. Thanks everybody for tuning in. This is fun. quite the load here, but I'm going to get it all. And I like to put this pile like more near the top, like my third layer of my pile, because this has the most manure in it, so that when I water it in, and I'm, you know, watering, it'll kind of like break apart the, the poop and then kind of like spread it out throughout the pile. That's just my idea. I don't know if it's true or not. Okay. So now we got a ton of stuff. 
There it is. So let's get you guys. You don't need to see me do this. Let's um. Well, let's see here. What am I doing next? Yeah, let's go back over there and then we'll chat more. So I don't make you guys wait. Okay. Oh yeah, we gotta get one more pile probably. This is my uh, automatic watering system and the feeding systems in the corner there. Maybe you guys can see. I got videos on how to build the uh, feeding system. But uh, here, check that out. I'm gonna get one more thing of browns for us and then we're gonna finish this pile. Okay, whew. So now, back to the pile. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. Whew. Yeah, flies are all over that pile. It's crazy. Okay, so let's get our next layer of browns. This is our third layer, I think, of browns. Just kind of hitting it to make the straw compact down and kind of fall into place. Okay, there we go. Then after that, I'm going to add one shovel full of inoculant or compost. I'll do one more. This is a big pile. Okay, and then let's run the water. Hey.
Get. Okay. Put the fence back up. <laughs> okay. Okay, guys, I'm going to answer your questions in a moment here. Let me set this up. I'm going to do that like that one uh, person suggested. I'll try to make kind of a hole. Try to help the water kind of stay in here better. Let's get this dialed in and oscillating correctly. Uh, I think we're there. Whew. Okay, cool. So, next layer will be the Bokashi. So, next layer is Bokashi, one more layer of browns, and then we've got a little bit more greens in this barrel, and then we'll top it out off of browns again. So, this is going to be quite a large pile. Let me grab, get a drink here and I'll... sprinkler I'm gonna build I think I'm just gonna build my own little contraption out of like half inch just have like a big spiral that I poke holes into of half inch and then just let it like have it be a dripper and drip down through so I just need to build that gosh this thing is a little aggravating Sorry, I just want to get it perfect because otherwise I'm going, to, I'm going to turn around and there's going to be a giant pile of water. All right. Oops. Okay. Whew. I'm just scrolling up to see where the, we left off. Cool, glad you guys are liking the chickens. I, I love watching them. I could watch them all day long. Wow, you guys posted a lot of stuff. Okay, I think I went back enough. Sorry if I missed your question. If I ever go in hot peppers and they're not hot. Um, you know, sometimes jalapenos have been like that to me. Like sometimes they turn out crazy hot and sometimes they don't turn out that hot. You know, I, I've only, I've grown cayenne, jalapeno, habanero, Maybe one or two other hot peppers, but I, I don't know. I'm not super knowledgeable on on peppers. I love the chicken. <laughs> I love the chickens. It's how you see saw them escape. Yeah, it's so fun. They uh, they're dying to get out. They love freedom. It's it's amazing. Just like we do. Oh, I haven't added the bokashi yet. I just filled my bins with mulch and garden scraps. Cool. Should I use composted chicken manure or fresh smelly ones? Well, the freshest stuff is gonna allow you to get, get hotter temperatures. Most of the poop that I'm using here, uh, other than the stuff in the chicken coop is dried. Once it gets wet though, I feel like it kind of reactivates it. And But you know, fresh manure is the, it would be the best manure to, to use in a compost pile. But it doesn't matter, dry is fine too, it still works. Salmonella is like crazy rare. I'm using my own bird's manure. And none of these birds have salmonella, so there's really no chance of it happening. You know, unless some wild bird brought in salmonella and their poop somehow landed. I mean, the thing is, that's like one of the reasons why I have my feeding and chickens um, automatic feeding system is like no wild bird can come in and poop in their water or poop in their food and then infect them. So that's another reason for having kind of these these automatic systems. <laughs> yeah, I should totally make a, a chicken video, just chicken sounds. That'd be fun to fall asleep to. <laughs> or wake up to, maybe. Do I get chickens vax, 
vaccinated maybe is what they're saying. I think you said vaccinated. I don't. Um, these, well, that's, that's not true. I, these birds I, I got at four and a half months old. So I bet you they, I bet you they were vaccinated. I, I don't know actually, I should ask the place where I got them. My place only does heritage breeds and they're really healthy. So I've really, I've stuck with getting their birds. I actually haven't, I've raised chicks before um, with my buddy when I used to live with him and he had roosters or a rooster. So um, I got to have the experience of raising chicks and having them hatch out of the egg. That was really amazing. Someday I want to have um, a rooster when I have some land. Uh, the chicken palace is made from uh, <laughs> is made from recycled materials and um, new wood from Home Depot too. Gosh, I, I used to remember how much it cost me, but I think including my solar powered automatic door and like all the fancy stuff I've put in here, like a thousand bucks, like the auto, all the automatic systems and the, the door is quite expensive. Um, hey Tracy, so glad you're li you're liking the videos. What's up, Simone? Does your compost need more time in the cold seasons? No, and that's something that um, might be a little bit of a, a misnomer. Is that like if you have a compost pile in the sun, it's going to get hotter? That's not true. Or you know, you can't compost in the winter. Well, that's not necessarily true either, unless maybe you're in sub-zero temperatures or so I don't know where the limit is because I grew up in San Diego guys so I you know I am not knowledgeable about cold weather or growing in cold weather other than what I've learned from other farmers what they say um, but um, the heat is coming from the microbes the heat is being generated by them mating and dying and eating and pooping and all it's like you know if you look at a city from space that, that city is a concentration of energy and life and, um, yeah, heat, essentially. <laughs> if you, it's much hotter than looking at, like, a prairie or something. So that's kind of like a macrocosm of the microcosm, if you want to think of it that way. But, uh, yeah, you can do a compost pile in the winter. It heats up because the microbes are consuming and expanding their population. Yes, my chicken system collects rainwater and feeds it to the chickens. Off, developing awesome skills. Um, Muscovy ducks. I don't know if you can raise ducks and chickens without conflict together. I believe that you can though. I think I've seen that before. I, I think that would be possible. But I'm not an expert on ducks. I've never raised them. Okay. Um, you know, I have, luckily I haven't had any predators really attack my chickens. Um, that's because I'm pretty hardcore about always making sure that their coop is completely closed up before it gets night, before the sun drops. Um, but I also built this coop really strong. Like I have, there's chicken wire underneath the coop, all sides, there's no hole to get into this thing whatsoever. Um, I've never had, a, we do have raccoons that come through here. I just saw some tracks in my, my beds recently. Um, and uh, what else? Um, so, you know, the only way to deal with predators is to either bring in another predator or you must become the predator. And this is, you know, it's a part of farming. <clears throat> We're intimately connected with life and death. And, you know, we try to not, um, try to not thin out the population of, of things as much as possible, but sometimes that is what must be done to prevent damage. Um, so, have a heart traps are really great. If you don't want to kill the animal, have a heart traps work awesome. I actually just caught a possum last night, um, but I let it go because possums don't really cause me a lot of issues. It's actually skunks that cause me the problems. They're the ones digging up holes in my, my beds right now. So those are the ones I'm trying to get out of here, let's just say. Um, so, but, um, yeah, like, you know, if you can exclude them from your yard or make it difficult for them to come in, that's like the best way or have, you know, cats are really great. I've got cats that come through my yards all the time and they take out all the rodents for me. So I don't have gophers or rats because of a massive cat population in my neighborhood. 
What's up, Arizona? East Mesa? What's up? <laughs> um, a lot of this straw, recently I got it from my buddy, Rusty. What's up, Rusty, if you're watching? Um, he had a bunch at his house, just like, it's been sitting around for years and years, so he, he gave it to me. But, you know, you can get, I usually get them at, like, feed stores in town. And they go anywhere from, like, 8 to $11. Um, I try to buy like the, the messed up straw if I can, and I use that in their chicken run, but inside of their coop where they're sleeping and breathing a lot, I only use fresh, clean straw just to prevent any sort of problems for their immune system. I also use straw for, I use straw for their, um, nesting boxes as well. Actually, plug this back in here. So like the box I'll show you see I just use straw they, they they like it they have no problem with it the stores will try to sell you that really fluffy stuff but that's like way overkill they're they don't need it um, and then they just kind of make their own little nest out of it what else I think we still need more water here we're getting close though. Another minute or so and we're gonna put Bokashi on. How often do I flip the pile? Well, that is really determined by the heat of the pile. And this is something that I've uh, changed in my compost making that I've really upgraded and gotten better at. And, you know, I used to turn it like once a week or every five to seven days and it was like on a time schedule. But that um, is kind of a, um, I'm not uh, taking in all the information to make the best decision possible. There's a better time to turn the pile than every five to seven days. And in my compost video this, that's coming out in the next couple of days, um, I really touch on that heavily, um, but I'll try to explain it. Basically this pile, it's gonna reach maximum temperature in about 72 hours. And when it hits that max temp and starts to drop a little bit, that's when I'm gonna immediately turn it. So about the fourth day, third or fourth day, I'm turning that pile. Because um, um, if you just allow that pile to reach max temp and then cool to the like 120 or lower, it's gonna burn up most of that high nitrogen content. And then after you flip it, the pile's never gonna be able to reach back up and hit those high temperatures again. And that was something that was consistently happening to me is I couldn't reach a high temperature again after turning it. And that was one of my big problems. So <clears throat> when it hits that high temperature, as soon as it starts to drop, you're turning it. As soon as you notice any type of anaerobic condition, so that would be something that you smell. It smells like shit or death or, you know, a horrible smell. It's unmistakable. Um, that would be another time you absolutely must turn the pile. We're always preventing the anaerobic condition and trying to encourage aerobic oxygen rich conditions. Um, the compost inoculate could also be regular garden soil. Yes, I could take the inoculate from one of my garden beds out here. I could take it from some really good inoculant if you want to inoculate more fungal. So you can actually um, push your compost more towards bacteria, bacterial growth or fungal growth for different purposes. I'm not going to get into that today, but you could actually go into an old growth forest or, you know, some place where there's been an established ecosystem for decades or a hundred years or more. That place has the ultimate ecosystem of microbes. So that's a place you can actually get stuff as well. Regular soil. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I wouldn't just dig up this crappy soil from my neighbor's yard. That, that soil's dead. There's nothing in it. Um, so you want to, you, you know, worm casting's another place you can gather uh, microbes, and inoculant. I put clay in my compost to mineralize it. Nice. Sure. Works good. Um, Did I learn, I definitely didn't learn this from college or public school, I'll tell you that right now. Um, I've mostly, I've learned all of this from other people, from YouTube, from books, from podcasts, um, and from self-experimentation, not self-experiment, but experimentation 
Um, myself, uh, working. <laughs> the chicken's tearing up my stuff. Uh, uh, but yeah, I learned all this stuff basically just by doing it and by trying to make it happen. YouTube, honestly, that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons why I have a YouTube channel because people like, there's a million names I could mention, but of course, Curtis Stone, Richard Perkins, Connor Crickmore, Diego Footer, um, John Kohler, you know, so many of these awesome people that keep putting all this information out. That's why I wanted to make a YouTube channel as well to keep pushing this information out there. But yeah, you can learn everything on the internet and from other people and don't feel like you need a formal education. I'm not even a, I did go to college, I have a university degree, but I'm honestly not the biggest fan of universities anymore. I think it, the return on investment that you pay to go to a university, that you don't really get that back unless you're a doctor or a nurse or a specific thing. Um, San Diego property is very expensive. Uh, that's why the way to set this up and to way to make small, a small farm, backyard farm work is to get a very low lease, low cost lease. And that's going to be by um, contacting your neighbors. I'm working on this right now, actually, and it's it's been difficult to find the ideal spot, but it's been amazing to find how many people um, are interested in um, volunteering their land to be used because they want to have a beautiful backyard. They want to um, receive free food every week. They want to learn how to grow food themselves. So for many um, landowners or homeowners, they're really interested in this. Um, so, you know, I see a huge possibility. Uh, you know, to, I started, I built, uh, I started farming with my best friend about seven years ago and almost eight years ago now. And um, the time from then till now is amazing to me. I can't believe how many people are interested in, in growing food themselves or buying local food or interested in organic food. Um, I think it's just kind of exploded in the pop and at least in the U S population. I don't know about other places, but it seems to be extremely popular in, in Europe and Australia and as well, if not more popular there. So it's very exciting. So guys, the next step here is I need to um, do Bokashi here. Okay, so. Okay guys, so this is gonna be the third green layer now. And these are my Bokashi buckets. These are buckets that you can uh, vapor seal so that you can be extremely airtight. Now, this Bokashi, it smells kind of like, um, I don't want to say kimchi, but um, a very, a very fermented food. It's, it smells, you know, it's not the best smell. It's not horrible, though. So what I like to do is have my wheelbarrows set up with my browns. So as soon as I dump it out, I can dump the next layer of browns on top and not, like, have it be disgusting. So I'm going to get some more browns and then come back. And I promise I'll go through all the questions and answer them all. Um, so I got to keep moving here. So let's uh, let's give you guys more chicken action, I guess. I'll try to put you. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So we got two more layers of compost to make. If you missed any of the video, I'm going to be putting out a couple more videos about compost making coming out soon. There are super in-depth videos that I hope will answer most of the questions that you've asked already, actually, and, and in more depth. So I'm going to get some more brown materials, have fun with the chooks, and see you in about five to ten minutes. Whoops, gonna be a little more slow. 
Uh, if you guys are interested, I, I've got a mailing list now. I'm gonna start putting out a monthly email just with, uh, you know, different tips and tricks that I'm not gonna put anywhere else. I think I have a link in my description and you guys can just click on that and you'll be signed up for the newsletter. And if you guys are interested, I also have a Patreon page where all of my the donations that people make to Nature's Always Right, um, if you donate $10 or more, there's actually rewards where you can have an email with me and you know ask any of your gardening or farming questions. I'll even do a Skype session with you, uh, help you plan out your garden, whatever you'd like to do. Check that out, the link's in the description as well. And I'm gonna go get the browns and be right back. And in case you guys are wondering on this chicken system, it's those things are called poultry nipples. And those are the same type of watering systems that they use in like the large, large scale commercial systems. And I like these, they work really well, but um, I'm gonna switch to these other ones. They're called, uh, I think they're like, they're like these cups and the, the chickens click them and a pool of water fills into a cup and then they drink from the cup. Now, and the reason I wanna to switch to that is because as I've observed my chickens over the last couple of years, that's their favorite way to drink water and that's how they do it in nature. In a puddle of water, like they love drinking out of a puddle. You know, they scoop their mouth in there, they tilt their head back, and they love it. So this, to me, is just, when I watch them, it's just not natural, how they naturally want to drink water. So what I'm going to do is, is switch over to that system, and I'm going to build a, I'm going to show a whole video about how to do that eventually. But I just wanted to tell you guys, because I'm in love with this system. Um, and then uh, you can also build a smaller one just out of a five-gallon bucket. And so for, like, less than ten bucks, you can have an automatic waterer. Thank <laughs> you. 
Almost done. Just need like one more scoop. Okay, so almost there. Just gonna bring the wheelbarrow out and then we're gonna do the next layer. Now we're ready. So next here, we're going Bokashi style. Try to get you guys closer to the pile now. The shade is out. Come on. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. Let me build the next layer and, and add some more water and then we can talk again and I'll uh, answer some more questions. Whew. Whew. Ugh, these gloves are nasty. Well, okay, Here comes the Bokashi. So 
You'll see I, I put a lot of citrus in there. You might be able to tell it's a lot of grapefruit. My favorite grapefruit is uh, Blanco de Oro. It's got, got really big, sweet juice pockets. It's really good grapefruit. So after you, uh, so for the Bokashi, you just keep adding your material until you've added as much as you want. And then you just let it sit for two weeks and finish fermenting. And then you can finally add it to a compost pile. And then I'm gonna spread this out as thinly as I can. You know, some people like, they bury the Bokashi and they do stuff like that. I don't, cause I, I found that working it into the compost pile is like crazy effective and I love it. So let me get the rake going. Where's that rake? So you'll notice I even, oh, there's um, there's a chicken carcass in here. There's, so you know, there's some meat, a little bit of bones. And that, once that's broken down, those things have incredible amounts of nutrition in the soil. There's even a, a scoby in here from when I made kombucha. So there's all sorts of stuff. There's eggshells. I actually run all my eggshells through Bokashi first. And it helps them liquefy and just get totally, yeah, disintegrated in the pile. So. Basically, like, Bokashi's allowed me to never have any food waste at my house. Nothing. Like, every, it's either going in Bokashi, or it's going to the chickens, or it's being fed to the soldier fly larva. And that's it. Okay. I'm pretty happy. That's a nice layer. So now let's get the browns going. You know what guys, I, uh, I would want to do, I would want to put browns, greens, and one more brown layer, but I'm, well, basically I don't have any more chicken bedding. So either I need to get browns from some straw, or I could put all the greens in this layer, which, which is kind of overkill because the Bokashi is like a super concentrated high nitrogen. That's how I treat it at least. So... Yeah, maybe the best option is uh, just cover this right away, and then I will, um, I'll just have to use some straw, even though I'd, I'd rather not. Uh, just because that straw hasn't been like raked apart by the chickens yet or chewed on or anything. So it just, you know, newer straw just takes longer to break down. And I'll just have a little bit more uncomposted straw at the end of the pile, but that's okay. <clears throat> so this next time here, when I add more straw to my chicken coop, I'm gonna add a, um, maybe one extra whole bale of hay so that in another month when I make another pile, that stuff will be pretty chewed through and, and be ready to um, add to a new pile. And I'm really, I really just like using my, my browns are just for my chickens, you know? It's all their manure mixed with wood chips, straw, old vegetation and leaves, as many carbon sources as I can get. Okay, let's cover this. mega compost pile. This is how big I want to make them every time, but I sometimes I don't have the, enough ingredients. So let's get this little spread out. That's, you always kind of want to make the layers combine a little. If you guys want to see an update to this pile, I'll, I'll post an update on my Instagram story 
Um, when this thing heats up tomorrow, I'll show you guys the temperatures. So if you want to keep following this, maybe check me out on Instagram, Nature's Always Right, and you can see what's going on. See if I know what I'm talking about or not. Because if it doesn't heat up, then maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so... I'm just messing around. <laughs> okay. Now, in your compost pile, if you see any, like, large chunks of wood chips or sticks or things like that, get those out of there. They don't break down, and they can even rob nitrogen uh, because they just, they don't break down. And I'll talk about that in my composting video. Okay, so next is water. So we need a little bit more inoculant on there. And you'll notice that I, I add my inoculant or my compost right before I water so that that water is percolating all that, all those microbes and, and whatever needs to go through the pile to help bring it up to temperature. Okay. So, looks good. Let's get this thing wet. Also, any rocks, get the rocks out of there. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna let this thing run for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and then there's gonna be one last layer. I have a little bit more greens. So I'll put that out, and then I'll just put the right amount of browns on there to, to finish it off. We'll get it wet one more time, and then it will be done, and it's gonna start heating up. So let me get the wire, water dialed in here, and I'll answer some more questions. I'll try to get to all the questions if I can. I do need to leave by like five because I'm trying to go find more land. So I wanted to go bug some neighbors and see if they'll uh, let me let me expand my farm to their place. Okay, we're done. Let me sit on something. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now we can chat again here. Whew. Hope you guys are enjoying the video. I'm trying to keep the action going as much as I can. It's hard to do it all in film and do all that at the same time. My hands dry here. Okay, let me scroll up and... Yeah. Okay. Oops, gosh darn it. Top chat. I think. Ooh. Hold on here, let me scroll up and figure out where the heck we are. Uh. Ba -ba -ba. Sorry if I didn't scroll up far enough. Um, I don't use horse or goat manure. I, um, I may use horse manure in the upcoming plot because I have a couple of uh, customers that have, you know, that take really good care of their, their horses and, um, Sorry, let me adjust this. Yeah, they take really good care of their horses. They feed them good stuff. So um, I'm gonna probably use horse manure as the base layer of my next plot. Azomite, yeah, azomite's great. I use that for minerals as well. 
It is from a volcanic ash deposit. It's like 70 trace minerals. I use it um, in my, I always add a little bit to my uh, compost when I'm mixing it out in the field. Um, I use it to feed fungal activity and for my foliar sprays when I do compost teas and all that stuff. Um, rock dust is awesome. Uh, how much space do you need for a family of five? Um, there's people that have calculated that online. You know, one of the most difficult things about growing food for your family is growing calorie rich food in your backyard. You know, something a lot of us, a lot of us don't think about, I think is like, you know, most of the stuff we're eating in our garden from, from our garden is high mineral content food and not really high calorie rich food. You know, the lettuces, the greens, the tomatoes, the, the, um, whatever, the peas, the, all that stuff. It's not super calorie rich. You know, most of our diet, the calories are coming from grains or uh, fats or meat. If you really look at people's diet. Um, but anyway, sorry. Um, family of five, I don't know, a half acre. I think I could raise enough food for a family of five on a half acre with some, you would, I would definitely recommend raising animals to do it. You would want to raise your own meat. Cause like I said, you're not going to be able to raise enough calories to be able to feed your family most likely. Um, but there's lots of people who have done tons of work on that, those type of calculations. Oh yeah, I, I feed my chickens um, in there and they have a little tray for them. And I get this stuff from my local feed store. It's called um, pigeon mix or pigeon something. I don't know. Anyways, in it there's oyster shell, charcoal, uh, potassium, some type of mineral too. And uh, they really like that stuff. And I, and I even supplement with more oyster shell too. Like they've always got it in case they wanna, in case they need it. And that the, cal, um, the shell is for the calcium in case you're wondering. And then it also has, the mix has these little rocks that the chickens will swallow because they have a special organ called the crop. I believe it's called the crop. And that organ basically contains little rocks and the food goes through there and grinds it up. So when they eat seeds and all this undigestible stuff that we can't eat, we don't process like corn, things like that. It goes into, the, I think it's called the crop. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but it, that's where it grinds up and they grind up all this stuff and they can digest it. Mm -hmm. Cold weather compost is much slower, but you can't keep it hot. You have to baby it more. Cool. Great advice. Possums are nature's pest control. They're awesome. Yeah, I agree. That's why I don't, I let them do their thing. Um, I let the skunks do their thing too, for the most part. I've, I don't, I, I never want to um, kill an animal really, or kind of, I really never want to intervene into the ecosystem unless something's like way out of balance. Um, so for the most part, those, those, uh, the skunks and all the possums, yeah, they totally eat the grubs. They eat all this stuff that um, is going to mess stuff up. So I'm a big fan of those guys, as long as they're not damaging crops, which, you know, does happen. My dog has killed two gophers. Very nice. Yeah, dogs and cats, man, they really um, are great protectors. And honestly, you know, I believe in working with animals and um, they are so integral to the farm. It's unbelievable. So I'm a big fan of the synergy between animals and humans and um, what we can do together. It's pretty amazing. That's why I love chickens so much. Um, so the cat's pooping on the property. You know, I, the, I've only ever seen cat poop in a dry area. So they only like to, to poop in a dry bed of stuff. My beds are always wet or they're covered with a tarp. So that's never happening. Um, where I have found their poop though, I have found it in like a, my old dry compost pile before, or, um, luckily like all these houses have litter boxes everywhere. I have a sand pile in like two different places. So I think they're kind of choosing those areas to do that. Toxoplasmosis. I know, man, I trip out on that too a little bit. Um, but I do, like I said, I don't see the droppings in anywhere where my food is being grown. So. I'm not worried about that. Toxo is pretty scary stuff though. Joe Rogan always talks about it on the podcast. Um, a client, I've never watered my pile and I find it's always good. That's awesome. 
Um, that's a great point, actually. Thanks for bringing that up. You know, that's something I didn't mention in my video, but that's really important. Um, I'm in San Diego. It's very dry here. It's every afternoon we get a hot, dry wind, and that really sucks the moisture out of the pile. So that's why I water mine a lot more. Plus the carbon material that I'm using, like straws, crazy absorbent. Uh, so that's another reason why I'm adding extra water. Um, depending on the nitrogen materials you're using, those could make it a lot wetter too. Um, I don't have like, if I had a ton of squash, like a, you know, 10 pounds of squash and 10 pounds of cucumbers and 10 pounds of tomatoes, like these really watery, juicy things. In that case, I wouldn't water water as much because all that's gonna liquefy and then kind of osmosify, or I don't know what the, that's, that's a word, but uh, be sucked into all the carbon surrounding it like a sponge. So interesting. Yeah, climate is another factor there that you wanna consider. I live in San Diego, California, USA, from Uruguay. How cool. Composting beer, making residues with chickens. Very cool. Yeah, there's actually a lot of breweries here in San Diego. And um, one of my buddy who raises chickens feeds his a bunch of old brewery grains because he's got some friends uh, that make a lot of beer and um, they, he, they give it to him. He feeds it to the chickens. And that's another great waste stream. So you could feed those leftover brewery grains to your chickens, to if you raise um, soldier fly, if you want it, you can compost it. There's some different things you can do with it. And that's a really great waste stream that I want to play with more in the future. That's cool to know that the yeast, yeah, it kind of works together or something. Neat. What do you mean? If you're not spelling correctly, then I might not be able to figure out what you're saying. I'm sorry, if English isn't you know, your first language, maybe that's why. <coughs> um, would you ever add minerals? Um, do I ever add minerals to the compost? You know, I... I, I have in the past. I, I don't see it, that it would hurt. You know, adding in some more as adding in some azomite or trace minerals or kelp um, would be a good thing because um, the microbes and fungi they eat that stuff. And um, so yeah, I think it's a good thing. Why not? I haven't been. You know, I'm trying to do stuff as cheaply as possible. I actually have um, one th one way I do add minerals that I like to do is I'll um, add worm tea to my compost. So I don't have any ready right now, but if I did, at the end of the pile, I would dump a few buckets on top and let those microbes and all those micronutrients infuse. Um, I also have some comfrey and yarrow tea. I could dump that on there. That would infuse minerals as well. That's another way. So yeah, I, I like the idea of adding minerals. Um, Wood ashes and sawdust in a pile. Um, I haven't. Oh, you know, the only time I've messed with those materials is um, on a large scale, like using a tractor to compost back when I was farming with my buddy on two acres. And that's how we made compost. We did like, you know, I don't know, 60 cubic yards at a time with a tractor. And that had a lot of wood uh, shavings in it from like uh, horse pastures. Anyways, yeah, that, that um, that finer carbon material is awesome. That's how you get crazy hot temperatures. You can actually go beyond 160 and a couple of piles can even catch on fire. But uh, in a backyard, you're not gonna catch your compost pile on fire. I'd have to congratulate you. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Well, not too amazing. Ah. Okay, next. Carbon and ash is high potassium, but only if the wood ash. Yeah, I don't know about those materials, guys. So I'm sorry, I can't give any advice on that. The water cups. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you get. I'm glad you, your chickens like them, Kevin. That's awesome. I can't wait to switch over to them. I just, yeah, I know they're gonna like them better. Coffee grounds and tea leaves, right in the garden soil. Um, I don't know. A lot of people like talk about doing that or they'll add the eggshells directly to the soil or something but like that takes like it's you can do that and that's fine but it's just not it's not going to instantly change your soil structure it's going to take time for that to, to decompose and to change and for the microbes and all these things to to convert it and to be usable by your plants um i don't know 
I'm honestly, I'm a big fan of just composting. Compost all of that type of stuff in a very intentional way. And the, the final outcome is gonna be so much better than just adding a little bit of um, coffee grounds or, or whatever. Um, you know, if you wanna increase acidity, like you're worried like your potting mix wasn't acidic enough and you wanna like increase acidity, then yeah, maybe just, yeah, you could throw some coffee grounds, some pine needles and, and water it and that'll help increase acidity. Yeah, but you can add it straight to the soil, but I just, I just don't see the point. I'd rather compost it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the encouragement. Is this still live? Yeah, it's still live. Uh, how many drink haven emitters? Um, what am I running? I'm, I'm running 15 PSI on my drip tape because I have the thickest type of drip tape. I think it's 15 mil. And I chose the, I think I chose the highest gallon per hour. It was like 0.68 or point something. I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see here. Woohoo! East Mesa, that's awesome that you're getting your bed ready. Congrats. How long? For this compost pile, it's going to be done. This compost pile, without a doubt, will be done in, in eight weeks. It should be done sooner. Like I said, if I wasn't using, uh, if I was able to uh, chop up all this carbon material and make it really fine, then this stuff, I bet I could make it break down in like four, five, six weeks. Um, but I just, I just have yet to try that. You know, usually most of it's broken down to soil and I have to wait another like two or three weeks because a lot of the straw is not totally done. So that's what's kind of holding me back. Uh, but basically, oh, to know when the pile is totally done and ready to use, it'll go cold. So after you've turned it, it will not heat up again, and it'll stay at like 90 to 100. And eventually, it'll um, it'll just look like mostly soil, and the smell of it, it's going to smell neutral and woody and earthy, and, and uh, there should be no type of poop or anaerobic smell at all. Shouldn't smell like much. Tumbler composters are great. Um, but I, you know, I have, it's hard to get those to heat up really well. They're a little more tricky. Um, I know like John Kohler on Growing Your Greens, he loves those in his backyard. Their tumblers are great if you don't have a ton of room. Um, one thing I don't like about the tumblers a little bit is that it doesn't have access to the ground. So earthworms can't enter, bugs can't enter, um, extra microbes from the ground can't enter. You know, I always build my compost pile in the same spot and underneath this area, it's, I'll have to do a, a microscope test to see what's in the soil right here, but it's probably out of control because uh, I've been making compost here for the last two years, almost two years. But uh, if you have rat problems and stuff, that's a, that's why like those tumblers are real nice. Yeah, if you tuned tuned in late, don't worry. You can go back and watch this later, or um, stay tuned for my composting videos that are coming out in the next couple of weeks. I'm gonna regurgitate all this information many times. The wheelbarrow, uh, I've got one that's like a full size, I don't know what the, I forgot how, what the size is, like a three quarter yard or something, or something. And I have a smaller one that I like to use for my beds because I've only got eight, eight inch pathways. Glad you guys are enjoying the video. What's up Arizona? The zonies, we call, in San Diego, we call people from Arizona zonies. <laughs> no offense at all. Um, let's see here. I have a tumbler compost room putting scraps in for nearly two years for family four and I still haven't dumped it out. It's amazing how much it breaks down to nearly nothing. Yeah, yeah, like this pile is gonna, like the size that you see it at right here, it's gonna shrink so much. It'll shrink to about a third of that by the time it's completely soil. Um, yeah, leaves and grass clippings are awesome. They are great materials. Leaves are superb. Um, how wet should it stay? It should be like the moisture of a wrung out sponge. If it's too moist, it will go anaerobic. It will not heat up and you will be encouraging the wrong bacteria. So just be careful and don't be discouraged because compost making is not easy. It's 
there's a lot going on there's a lot of variables there's a lot that can go wrong and you just got to keep trying you know if you know one way to get better more quickly is to take notes so take notes of the amount of water you added the type of materials you added like you know how thick the layers that you tried to make and those are some ways to to help you to get it and my composting videos come out i really try to cover a lot of issues that you might come up uh, come across and how to address those <laughs> justin's back baby what's up justin <laughs> um <laughs> it should be moist like a sponge yeah basically like that not a not a dripping wet sponge but a more of a wrung out kind of sponge uh, oyster shells, great. I love supplementing that for my chickens. I even put oyster, a little bit of oyster shell in my, uh, what you might call it, uh, worm castings, and uh, that helps them create. Uh, I was talking to, to uh, John Kohler about this, and uh, it helps them create chitin, which is a, I think it helps create some of the strength of the cell structure of the plant. So I add a little bit in there as well. I have possums, and they eat your strawberries. Oh. Dang it. <laughs> yeah, the one I caught last night was like, it was so confused when I let it out. It was just, it was just like, get me out of here, man. See you later, Mississippi. Glad, glad you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. What's up, man, with the master plan? Um, well, for now, I'm trying to get more land, expand my farm. I'm thinking about possibly building a greenhouse. Um, I really like bootstrap farmers, greenhouse gear, like anything they make really is so high quality and they're friends of mine. So I'll probably build one of their greenhouses and then I want to uh, do a lot more microgreen production. I just kind of played around with it this year and focused more on the field greens and my YouTube channel and all that. But I really need to get a, you know, a real productive microgreens operation going here to increase the cash flow and profit profitability of my farm. But I also want to go get you know, another three to 6,000 square feet, something like that, uh, so that I can um, have a lot more grow beds and more options and all that. So that, that's my next step right now. D -d -d -d, pine needles, I don't, hmm. I feel like there's an issue with pine needles. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm gonna look that up later. Um, can I compost leaves with powdery mildew or other diseases? Yes, but you must reach those high temperatures. If you don't, I don't know what temperature powdery mildew dies at, but I think above 130 or 140, it's going to die. You've got to make sure you're reaching those temperatures or it's going to go dormant in your compost and you're going to inoculate your soil with possible bad fungi and stuff like that. So if you have diseased or, da or diseased uh, plants, you know, I don't recommend composting diseased plants unless you're a very good experienced composter and you feel confident that you can raise those temperatures correctly. If not, um, maybe do a separate compost pile that's very long uh, so that all that stuff will die out or put it in the landscaping waste for your city. Nice, John. I'm glad the wood chipper works great. I really want to try that on, on the compost pile. I feel like that's like kind of the last uh, missing piece to my my uh, composting skills that like is keeping me from having it like go real fast. Pine needles take time to break down. They're great as a mulch. Yeah, I like pine needles as a mulch personally. I've never tried to put them in a pile. I I feel like they're too acidic. That could be an issue. Plenty of space to make compost. Does garden compost? <laughs> Yeah, you know, soils. If you go to Home Depot and buy soil, it's crazy expensive. It's like seven or eight times the price as if you bought it from like a local soil maker. That's way better quality, and then they just come and dump it on your land. I would highly recommend you find a local compost maker rather than going to Home Depot, unless you just need a, need a small amount. How hot today? It's been amazing recently. It's just been in the 80s. And that's enough water now. Um, so yeah, it's just been in the 80s this week. Right now, man, it's gorgeous. This is why people that live in San Diego though, because, you know, we get hot, like we go up to 100, but then in the summer, there's always like multiple weeks where we dip back down into the 80s and it's really nice. 
I know some of you guys out there in the south in Texas places like or maybe even like New York you guys just stay up there hot and humid so I feel for you guys we're have we're going back up to hot temperatures again this weekend back up into the mid 90s so I'll be back with you guys sweating my ass off soon <laughs> how do you make soil loose and good for root veggies well that takes time um, my beds out here most of these beds I've uh, have gone through about five plantings and in a future video I'll show but so when I first started broad forking these beds you know I could get the tines in like halfway and then like struggle to try to get more deeper um, now after about a year of no-till compost teas all the different um, soil life stuff that I do I can now basically all my beds my broad fork now shoop, sinks right in there and I can get a full lift. It's insane. I love it. Um, it's so cool to see all this stuff work, uh, to prove that it works, to, to show all the naysayers that think organic farming and no-till farming is not real, that, you know, how to make good soil. And these type of practices that I'm doing and these other people, these no-till, beyond organic people are doing, it, it really is the ultimate for soil health. And anyways, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit religious about it, let's just say. <laughs> All right, um, how do you, okay. So yeah, broad forking and then yeah, adding more organic matter, converting that soil, getting the clay out of the soil, which the, the soil life is gonna do for you. Double dig, yeah, I'm, you know, some people are big fans of double digging. Yeah, it works, it's, it, um, it's good, but like, it's a lot of work and for me and myself personally, I don't see um, the, well, for me on a large scale, it would be insane. It would be too much work. But if you have horrible, rocky clay, just absolute, a nightmare uh, soil, it's, double digging is a great way to instantly, like, have the best, you know, just put in beautiful soil, boom, ready to go. And then that, that soil will slowly start inoculating the soil around it and convert the soil around it. But it's a hell of a lot of work. Um, I think for a home garden, double digging is cool, but not for a market garden or commercial scale. Same question as Kevin. I heard if you toss disease stuff in green waste, when they turn into fertilizer, they nuke it to hot to kill anything. Yeah, any disease stuff, as long as it's hot enough, it's fine. My compost pile does not smell, and as long as you're building it correctly, it will not smell. And correctly means it's aerobic. If it's anaerobic, it's going to stink. And you'll know it as soon as you open that pile up, it's, um, it's going to have one of, I'd say, three smells. So one smells bad. It's anaerobic. So it's going to smell like poop, like a dead body, like a, a dead rat or something. Um, uh, aerobic, which aerobic, I'll say aerobic and neutral, which is more towards the end of your pile when it's more closer to being done. And it'll have kind of a woody, neutral, earthy smell. And then you'll have more, what this pile will smell like when I turn it next, it's gonna smell aerobic and I'm gonna smell an ammonia smell, most likely. And the ammonia smell is a sign of off-gassing of nitrogen. And ammonia is NH3, I believe, in chemistry. So it's a gas and <clears throat> it's just the, essentially there's, there's too much nitrogen in the pile and it's kind of off gassing some of that and that's that smell but the ammonia smell is not necessarily a bad thing it just means that either you know your pile is high high nitrogen it means you're gonna you're you're definitely at a high temperature and um the ammonia smell doesn't bother me that much but it means yeah let's get this thing mixed let's get more oxygen in there let's mix the carbon and the nitrogen together better so that we're not off gassing so much nitrogen so those are kind of the three smells um, what is the first thing you would recommend if you wanted to do what you do? I have a quarter acre at least to work with. I'm a stay-at-home dad and my kids just started school. Yeah, a quarter acre is great to start with. So the first thing, um, I mean, I don't know what your growing experience is, but obviously just start growing. Just start a garden. That's how I started um and that's how a couple of my friends have started um, we just started growing food just getting some initial experience grow a lot of different types of things grow things that you're interested in that are going to be fun for you to grow 
Um, you know, spend a season doing that. Spend during that season. Go volunteer on farms. Go volunteer at some master gardener's place. Go volunteer or try to get um, something. You know, get get some hands-on experience. That's the number one thing. Um, I, you know, as much as you you can read and learn a heck of a lot, you can watch videos and learn a heck of a lot. But um, ultimately, your experience, your personal observations. All of that that just kind of like gets downloaded by your brain, that is what makes the farm an experienced farmer so valuable and so irreplaceable is that, you know, there's just certain things you just can't learn in a book. Um, so I'd start like that and start slow. Um, start with like, I don't know, when you're ready to go production and sell it, start with like two or 3,000 square feet. Basically kind of like what I'm doing. I'm, mine's slightly bigger than that. and. Start selling to your friends, start selling to your family, start there. You know, message people, you know, on Facebook and then, you know, start to get some sales, start to get some interest. And then, you know, over time, you got to slowly transition from your current job to your, to the next job. And it's going to be a transition that takes probably, a, it took me two years. It took, you know, and then I, I farmed for two years before that, just gaining experience working with my friend, basically working for free and just learning. So it is a large time investment, um, but it's absolutely possible to do it. If you want to do it, I'd say just keep following, um, you know, people like Curtis Stone, John Martin, Connor Creekmore, Eric Schultz of Steadfast Farms, um, you know, smaller people like me or, um, uh, what's his name? Flavorous Farms on um, Instagram. He's an he's another amazing small farmer that's new. There's there's a lot of people starting right now. I just say just you know, kind of see what we're all doing. Keep asking questions. If your caramel smells, you did it wrong. Eh, I mean, I don't want to say the word wrong. Like you, it can be adjusted, so it's not like it's a complete disaster. If it's anaerobic, so let's say you got it too wet. Yeah, you made a mistake, but you can adjust. Pull the pile apart. Let it kind of um, let the air and sun beat on it and um, take some of that moisture off and away and then um, you know pile it back mix it up real good pile it back up and it should be fine and it'll it'll go back to aerobic <sighs> yeah if it smells like garbage it is anaerobic Caracas Venezuela wow very cool I'm Mariana cool hats thank you Oh, Moringa. Yeah, dude, it's right here. I don't know if you're still watching, but... Um, I'll show you one leaf from it. Uh, yeah, this is a Moringa. It's that plant right there. And Moringa is becoming more popular in the nutrition world because... It's a really incredible plant on a lot of different levels, but nutritional wise, it's pretty out of control. You know, the vitamins are through the roof. Uh, you can eat the pea pods, it grows really fast. It's good animal fodder. It's good, um, I think it nitrogen fixes. I'm pretty sure. Could be wrong. Sorry if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see about Moringa. I'll see if I can get it going. Maybe I can sell it or do something with it. We'll see. This worked great. Oh, I'm glad my pepper mix, or my pepper, I'm glad my um, soil mix worked, worked well for you. Sorry, my brain is a little fried right now. I um, just want to say thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, Wisdom's Peace. Should I cut the things I put in the compost before I put them in the pile? Um, if you want to take the extra time to do that, there will be a benefit. Um, I would especially say on a, I don't have an example, but like on a kale plant, you can have an old kale plant or a broccoli plant, anything with like a really thick green stem. It really helps to snap those and break them apart a little bit. Or if you have like a, like smash them with a hammer or something like that. And then that like allows access for the microbes and bugs and stuff to get in there and break it down real quick. And I've noticed that when I break apart those stems, the pile has no problem composting it and it melts in there. But if I don't break it apart and I leave it intact, and you know, like the outside of a, of the kale, it like calluses over and gets like armor. So it's hard for anything to penetrate it. So that's why you got to break it up a little. So, you know, yes, if you're doing a large amount of compost, like 
with a tractor, no. But for backyard, yeah. I think cutting up stuff is um, will help you to get your pile hotter and be more successful. <clears throat> I'm glad you guys have been enjoying it. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for the kind words. Yeah, I do, I do plan on, on hopefully having a full-size farm someday. Um, right now, my goals are just to make... My, I guess kind of my goal of my YouTube channel, besides just teaching as, as much of this stuff as I can, is to try to show people what's possible in a backyard, like how much can you actually grow, um, uh, and, and oh, sorry, and, and to, uh, you know, how to go from a backyard to expand that to a couple backyards so, so that you could actually make a living in an urban area. And then, you know, once me and my wife are able to save enough, enough money, the, the dream or the goal, what we're going to do, right, is um, buy some land. You know, I want personally at least 10 acres. And the plan is to build a larger scale farm. I'm, I'm really into design and experimentation and I'll, I have so many different ideas and like things I want to try out on a larger scale. So yeah, I'm really interested and having a larger farm and uh, you know doing more animal based systems and stuff like that having them uh, if you guys know what silvo pasturing is stuff like that is very cool to me um can you put and not put in compost and the compost pile i just made you can put okay i'll say what you can't so what you can't what i would not recommend to not put in you can literally you could compost anything but for the safest way in a backyard compost, do not compost onions, citrus, meat, dairy. I'd say those four are the big ones to really avoid. Coffee grounds are good. You can compost them. You can put them on top of the soil too. Grass cuttings are great. They're a very great, very good high nitrogen. It's age, okay. Oh, cool. Thanks, Indow. He says that uh, pine needles are, are acidic, but when they fully break down, they'll go to neutral. Cool. <laughs> yeah, if you're in El Cajon, it's 100, 100 degrees. <laughs> What's up, Kyle? Uh, what kind of plant on the East Coast? I am not the best person to ask. I'm a West Coast boy. I've been here my whole life. I've never been to the east well i've been to the east coast once i should say and i don't know a lot about growing in snow <laughs> thanks andrew um the biochar yeah i'm getting closer i've just been really busy my buddy rusty had got me a uh what are they it's like a, a 55 gallon metal drum it's one of those big drums i'm gonna be making a uh oh man the name escapes me T, it's a T lud it's called the T lud design for making biochar it's just a couple of metal barrels so I'm gonna be working with him to get that going I've just made biochar in my backyard and I have inoculated it and then I've put it into my compost and put it out into my my beds a little bit so I've I've messed around but I haven't taken it to the next level yet unfortunately leftover foods and compost absolutely just when you're making the compost pile, you make it once and then you don't add anything else to it. So you want to add as much nitrogen as possible in the beginning so that that whole process is able to happen and um, you're not adding more. If you're adding in more, that's considered you're adding in more pathogenic materials. So then you would want to restart your count of like two months or three months for safe composting. I'm gonna post this live vid on the channel. Yeah, 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 I'm gonna put this video on the channel for sure. Um, I don't know. I I guess I'll just put it up for everybody to watch. It'll at least be unlisted. I'm gonna make a live video playlist. So if you click on my playlist in my channel, it'll be somewhere in there once I uh, go offline. East Mesa. Hey, um, if I remember, I'll go check. If not, send me a DM and then I'll check. Flavor, flavorful Farms. Thank you, Justin. Totally blanked on his name. Yeah, guys, uh, if, if you're a new farmer interested in farming, 
Uh, I'd recommend two Instagram accounts. Um, gosh, Justin, I'm blanking on the name of your farm. But if you search uh, Justin Zunker on Instagram, you'll find his farm. And uh, Flavorful Farms is another buddy of mine. They're both new farmers like me, um, doing it on a small scale. And in my opinion, they're killing it. They're doing an amazing job. And they're people to uh, copy what they're doing. Yeah, the video about the soldier fly. I, you know, I could show you guys the soldier fly in a little bit here. Are you going to start selling seeds and other stuff online? I don't know about selling seeds. Yeah, I may sell some stuff online. I'm kind of, I'm really, I, I may sell products at some point. I don't know if it only, I would only sell something if I believe in it, if I think it would bring you guys value. Otherwise it's worthless and I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so maybe, um, I'm really more interested in, in making more educational content. So I may be doing some type of courses in the future, things like that, eBooks, um, uh, maybe different plans, how to build a how to build a coop um, with actual plans, like different stuff like that. I'm interested in making. I've got a lot of ideas of different like farm tools too that I want to make. So we'll see. I don't know what will happen in the future. Right now, I'm really focused on the farm and my YouTube channel and um, all that. But we'll we'll see what happens in the future. I I'm interested in those things. I, I saw a video where you mentioned you took a course that taught you. How to check minerals in your soil using a microscope. Oh, yes. Um, that one, it was like a local class taught by my buddy Richard. And he's the one who gave me the microscope, or sold me the microscope. Thank you, Richard. And um, gosh darn it. Sorry, it's kind of the end of the day and I've been talking. So I'm <clears throat> my brain is a little done. Um, but anyways, yeah, the class was local. It's uh, food. Um, uh, it's a composting collective here in San Diego. I'm totally blanking on their name right now. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, it was just like a local one-off class that he did. It's not something that happens often. I'll let you know. I'm going to do some videos about microscopes eventually. If you want the ultimate microscope class, though, Elaine Ingham is the person who has kind of pioneered this whole thing. And so I'd recommend looking up Elaine Ingham if you're interested in microscopes, soil biology, in that type of world. I have 15. Oops. Oh, so you guys asked why not onions and why not citrus? You can do a little bit of that in your pile and then it's fine. But um, they increase fungal growth in the compost and uh, so that's kind of the problem with them um, they just don't compost as well they're fine i mean just don't add a ton of citrus that or a ton of onion peel onions and stuff that's just my recommendation um but like i said i i, <clears throat> I do all my citrus and onions through my bokashi and then that makes it perfect so if you do bokashi you're good what else we got here uh i fit two fit, what time is it five okay I can fit two fifteen. Uh, sorry. What's this guy saying? It's son of two-star county. Oh, it's if you're not getting a lot of sun, then just grow things that are don't need a lot of sun. So nothing that produces a root or a fruit. So greens are going to be your best bet if you don't get a lot of sun or berries, fruit like that is okay with less sun. Freeze veggies so they mush and it's quicker to decompose. Hmm, never try that. Um, my farm is not going to be in California. I'm 99% sure that we are not going to stay in California. I grew up here. I love California. It's beautiful. Um, but unfortunately, the state is very expensive to live in. That's probably probably the, one of the number one things is that land cost is unbelievably high in San Diego. So to, you know, I can go to Texas and get it for a hundred grand, I can get 10 acres pretty easily. So a hundred grand can't get you anything. <laughs> you know, you're gonna pay $400,000 in San Diego and you'll get like a 1200 square foot house with like a backyard and that's it. Um, and California, honestly, the government's out of control. They're, you know, constantly trying to take away freedoms. 
uh, constantly more regulations, more taxes, the income tax is incredibly high, you know, all these things that are anti-business, anti-innovation. And uh, I don't want to support or pay taxes to a state that's going to run itself like this. Uh, so as much as I love California and I love the people here and I, all that, I'm, I'm not going to stay in a state that supports slavery of its own people. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't compost cast litter. Good, good call. What if your compost smells like mushrooms? Um, yeah, maybe you got some fungal growth going on in there, which would mean maybe it's a little too wet. Pull out part the pile and let it dry out a little bit. Um, you know, you could like I said, you can do citrus. It is, it works. I, you know, I just, I try to avoid doing large amounts of it just in case. Also, if you let the citrus dry out, then it's no problem. If, but if you're, if you were to put like, a, you know, a ten-pound bag of just uh, complete oranges into the, the pile, then, and I'm, this is for you guys. I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about right now is a backyard compost pile. So, if you're doing a gigantic pile that is like ten feet tall by fifty feet, it, like there's different rules that apply. So I'm, I'm talking more, and I'm speaking more conservatively too, since we are talking backyard composting. Oh, thanks for telling me what time it is. Um, oh, Z Gardens. Yeah, guys, check out Z, Z Garden Z on Instagram. And he's got a lot of great stuff that he's doing as a new farmer. I think he's he's doing super, super, super good. So supposedly worms don't like citrus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No citrus, no onions for your worms. Just, uh, I just give my worms like um, high mineral foods like um, squash, cucumbers, banana peels or bananas, apples, more sugary, higher sugar content, I guess is what I like to give them. Yeah, guys, don't freak out too much about the citrus. I don't want to completely scare you away. You know, if you throw a few in there, it's fine, but you know, just don't go overboard. Yeah, Tennessee's awesome. I've actually been there. That's where I did my uh, permaculture design course. I really like Tennessee. It's a very cool state. Ray, what's his name? Ray, da da da, from, uh, I can't remember anybody's name right now, man. Uh, uh, come on. He just did this big lettuce, uh, live lettuce course. It was awesome. Rose Creek Farms. Ray something. He's an amazing farmer. That's another great guy to follow. He's hooked up with Diego Footer and Curtis Stone and all those, all these market gardener guys. Grapeseed compost, interesting. I used to work at a winery and we work all the pumice into land. Yeah, I'm interested in using pumice instead of perlite. I know that feel I grew up in South Bay, yeah. <laughs> New York City, very cool. Missouri, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of states, Arizona, New Mexico, you know, preferably a state without income tax. We're looking at Texas. That's, you know, there's, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of good states. It's hard to choose. It's really hard to choose. We have to, uh, we need to go visit and really get the feel. Yeah, Oregon and Washington are amazing, but then they've got a lot of the problems that uh, California has government-wise and freedom-wise. Unfortunately, the people who live on the West Coast and New York, and the East Coast of New York, they want to control everyone and tell everyone how to live and what to do. And uh, yeah, I'm not okay with that. So, did I ever work as a golf caddy? Well, not a caddy, but I worked at Sun Valley Golf Course. That was my first job ever when I was 15. And I worked there for like a couple, a year and a half maybe. It was my first job and like I did uh, landscaping and got the driving range balls and all that sort of stuff. I swear I used to work with you. Mark? Mark. Hmm. I don't know, man. Maybe. That'd be cool. How good is that the next PewDiePie is likely going to be a gardener. <laughs> that would be pretty cool, man. I don't think any gardener will ever, ever have uh, 60 million subs, but that would be pretty cool if uh, somebody could do that. Um, Jay, can you visit my farm? Yeah, possibly. Um, DM me on Instagram. I collect castings about every two months. 
Yeah, Jay, if you're in San Diego and if you're interested in farming, then hit me up. Recycled expanded glass. I've never used that, Kyle, um, but I, I'm curious. Um, you know, perlite works great for me. I'm just always, I always want to play around with the other materials and see if I, if like it's cheaper or more sustainable and all that. I'm on five acres. Wow. Five acres, man. That's a lot. Of, that's a huge piece of land. I, I would just say, analyze what your market wants. You know, I can't really tell you what your, what your market wants, but find out, you know, what are, what are people desiring? Do you have subgenre markets? Do you have an Asian market that wants Asian vegetables? Do you guys have, you know, certain special, you know, specialty greens that only your neck of the woods wants? You know, there's all that sort of stuff. Ray Tyler. Thank you, Justin, for the names, man. <laughs> See you, Mark. Yeah, Ray Tyler of Rose Creek Farms, total badass, uh, amazing farmer, great guy. Definitely check out his place also. Thanks for watching, Joseph. Appreciate it. Okay, I think I just got to the end of the comments. Um, I'm going to stop answering here, and uh, I'm going to finish making this compost pile, and then I got to go try and talk to some people for an hour. My Instagram name is the same as my YouTube name, Nature's Always Right. Cool, Jay. Yeah, hit me up. Um, and uh, anyways, I don't know. If you guys want to keep watching, I'll keep the video rolling. And I'll talk a little bit while I'm making it maybe. But, like, we're kind of at the end here. And then, uh, yeah, you know what, guys? I just got to go. So I'm going to finish building this. I'll just tell you what I'm going to do. If you want to see how to finish off the compost pile, be sure to check out my new videos coming out in the next week. And I'm going to show you guys how to build the pile how to maintain the pile, how to analyze it and keep it aerobic and keep it healthy. So um, yeah, be sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so that you're able to see that. And um, if you guys don't hit the notification bell, you actually won't be notified that I'm going live and you'll actually stop seeing my videos if you start watching them. It kind of sucks like the YouTube algorithm. I've noticed it like, I, you know, I watch Joe Rogan, the podcast all the time. I stopped watching his podcast for like two weeks and then YouTube stopped showing me that um, they stopped showing me his new episodes. So then like, I was like, what the heck? And I had to go find it. Anyways, the notification bell is really important in YouTube now. If you want to be updated, I totally understand if you don't want to be bugged constantly though. Anyways, guys, so the last process here, I'm going to add the rest of my greens, add a little bit of straw on top, get it wet one last time. I'm gonna cover it with burlap. Covering it with burlap is gonna stop the sun from beating down, the wind from sucking out moisture. And then I'll come back tomorrow and measure the temperature. If uh, you'd like to follow me further on this pile, then go on Instagram tomorrow and um, I will post a story showing you the temperature that it's at. And uh, we'll see where we're at 24 hours later. I'll show it for the next few days. I'll show like the first turn on Instagram. Um, and then if you want to see more info on this whole, all this stuff, just check out my new videos. They're coming out soon. And yeah, my Instagram name is nature's always right. Follow me on there too. If you guys don't mind and that's it guys. I don't know. I'm going to keep making the pile. Totally understand if you guys don't stick around, but Thanks again for watching and participating. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you for all the help in the comments. And I'll see you guys in the next video, all right? And oh, if you guys wanna sign up for my newsletter, down in the description there, I've got links to my newsletter. If you'd like um, to support the content that I make, um, you know, I don't, I'm not paid to do any of this. I don't make any money really from YouTube. I'm doing this because I love it, because I wanna teach uh, people how to grow their own food, how to make yourself successful. So if you ever feel compel compelled, um, to donate or to be a patron on Patreon, I'd really be appreciative. Um, if not, that's totally cool too, because I'm always going to put out information for free. So, all right, guys, I'm going to finish this pile off. Have a wonderful day. It was super fun chatting with you guys. I'll see you guys in the next live video.